Welcome everybody and thank you, Hillary. Um, what a great event to have on our first day of snow since last winter. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, there were a lot of groups that were interested in this topic and we are thanking all of them. Tonight's lecture is sponsored by Cone Haddow Center for Judaic Studies, and it is supported by the Michigan Arts and Culture Council and the National Endowment for the Arts. And it is presented in partnership with the Muslim Jewish Advisory Council and the Jewish Community Relations Council slash American Jewish Committee, uh, otherwise known as JCRC, AJC. All of our sponsors, and our partners tonight, along with the Jewish Historical Society of Michigan, are deeply, greatly involved with the importance of history. And in the case of the JCRC, AJC, they're involved with building bridges between the Jewish community and other communities. So a perfect fit for tonight's topic. Uh, tonight, to introduce our speakers is uh, my friend, Bryant Frank. Mr. Frank is a Detroit attorney. He is an activist. He's a member of the board at um, JCRC AJC. And he's gonna tell us a little bit about the Muslim Jewish Advisory Council and then introduce our speakers. So welcome, Brian. Thank you, Jeannie. Nice to be here with you all. Good evening, everybody. As Jeannie said, my name is Brian Frank. And currently, aside from other things I do, I am the co-chair of the Muslim Jewish Advisory Council, MJAC Detroit. And it's a group comprised of lay and religious leaders from Detroit's Jewish and Muslim communities. And they're dedicated to joint domestic civic engagement for the mutual benefit of both communities. MJAC's a proud sponsor of tonight's program. And it is my privilege to introduce our esteemed lecturers, senior lecturer in the departments of Near East and Asian Studies and Global Studies, and the Director of Global Studies at Wayne State University, Said Khan, and Professor of History and Director of the Cohen Haddow Center for Judaic Studies, also at Wayne State University, Howard Lupovich. Given JHSM's mission, it would seem appropriate that I use this opportunity to share with you a, a somewhat recent but yet important milestone event um, involving Muslims and Jews in Detroit that directly links to this evening's program and more specifically to our lectures. In 2013, two local organizations, the Michigan Muslim Community Council and the Detroit Regional Office of the American Jewish Committee jointly commissioned the U of M Dearborn's renowned Center for Innovative Research, it's known as iLabs, to conduct a survey of our respective communities to determine the, the perception of each community of the other and further to determine whether these two groups possessed any interest in increasing their engagement with one another. The survey took several months to construct and ultimately drew upon responses from more than 600 participants. iLabs processed the data and presented its findings in a comprehensive research report entitled, Building a Shared Future, Understanding the Muslim and Jewish Communities of Southeast Michigan. It was detailed and fascinating and time really does not permit me to go into depth with respect to its content. I will, however, share with you one significant finding. 90% of the respondents expressed the desire to interact with the other's community. Taking their lead from this report, the two commissioning organizations undertook to continue, and they continue to undertake, excuse me, concerted efforts to bring their respective communities together. And the crown jewel of those early efforts is an annual three-part lecture series appropriately entitled the Shared Future Lecture Series. And here's the link to tonight. Commencing in 2014 and every year since, this lecture series has featured my friends Saeed Khan and Howie Lupovich, who prior to that first series only casually knew one another. This lecture series merely formed the beginning of a dynamic professional affiliation and friendship. Howard and Saeed have since participated in at least 18 shared future lectures. They've co-taught continuing education courses. They've jointly, jointly spoken at a number of Wayne State campus one-off events and appeared jointly on WDET Stephen Henderson's Detroit Today. We can now uh, add tonight's lecture to that growing list. I take, excuse me, immense pride in being among those who were able to make this shidduch nearly a decade ago. And you should also know that it, as it turned out, 
Shared interests between the two extend beyond joint lecturing. Both are musicians and they have threatened, a la Jake and Elwood, to get the band back together again. Saeed, that's, that's not, that not so obscure pop culture reference was for your benefit. And Howie, you should know that Saeed recently shared with me that he's uh, doing special fingering exercises in order to tackle the more uh, challenging chords in David Bowie's Life on Mars. So you may, you may need to, to increase your practice time a bit. Um, so now I take great pleasure in turning the screen over to tonight's speakers, Saeed Khan and Howard Nathan Lupovich. Thank you. Thank you, Bryant. Um, Howie, I think uh, we should probably do what we always do and uh, I'll follow your lead. Sure, sure, sure. Well, first of all, Saeed, it's great to see you. Uh, you know, the last time we saw we were in person, so it feels like almost a, oh, this is not, this is nice too. And uh, yeah, I know that Bowie song. I, I don't want to brag, but yeah, I've, 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 I've known that at least one guitar ago, but good for you for, you know, getting into the realm <laughs> of Bowie. Um, thank you everyone for sponsoring this event. Thank you to the Jewish Historical Society, Jeannie and Hillary and everyone else. And that nice introduction, um, Bryant, it's always, uh, it's always a pleasure to do events like this, to do them with Saeed, to have a chance to talk about these interesting topics. So what we're gonna talk about tonight, I mean, our topic, Jews and Muslims in Detroit, uh, you know, it, it's it's a rare occasion for me where instead of being able to speak only historically or academically as an intellectual, I can actually speak personally because turns out I have been a Jew living in Detroit for more than 50 years. So most of my life, I, I wasn't born here, but I lived here for all but the first year of my life. Um, but uh, so it's an opportunity to reflect on that. And I think, so I think, you know, I could talk about the broader, the, the broader trajectory of the Jewish community of Detroit, which is basically that Northwest move for a century from Hastings to Dexter to Northwest Detroit, to Oak Park, to Southfield, to Farmington Hills, to West Bloomfield. That's the story in a nutshell. It's, it's basically Northwestern Highway, more or less, to, to, sort of, to sort of reduce it to its essentials. But really what I wanna focus on is not so much what it has meant to be Jewish in Detroit, which I think is a pretty commonly known story, but uh, from the vantage point of, of the Jewish community, what was our sense of, what was our awareness, what was our attitude toward the Muslim community in Detroit? So in, in, in thinking about this, I, I, I was trying to think of, uh, you know, put myself back in my childhood self and what I was aware of. And well, what it really comes down to is until a certain point in time that I'll get to in a moment, I don't think we were very much aware of it at all. Uh, I'll, I'll give you an example. When I, when I was a student at Hill Day School, we would do interfaith events, but interfaith events in the 70s meant Jews and Christians. I don't remember a single interfaith event with the Muslim community in Detroit. And I don't think that was by any self-conscious design. I think that was more a question of convenience or pragmatism or, or, or the very fact that that's what, for the Jewish community, in those days, that's what interfaith meant, Jewish Christian. I, that's, that's simply what it was. My, my own knowledge, my own awareness was relatively limited. But I do remember, I do remember even as a kid, um, becoming aware of a kind of contrast. And the contrast would be this, when, it, when in those days, when, excuse the dogs barking, in those days when we would learn, we spend a good amount of time talking about, talking about Israel, Israeli society, Israeli politics. And remember, this is the days in the early 70s before Camp David, before Begin and Sadat, this was a day where Israel was essentially at war with its Arab neighbors. And so we, one of the things we would learn about Israel is an inherent antagonism between Jews and Arabs in the Middle East. Now, here is a useful time for me to point out, and Saeed, I'm going to have to reveal a little bit of, of early ignorance here, is that growing up, I really wasn't aware, and I don't think I was unusual in the sense, I wasn't aware that there was a difference between Arab and Muslim. I thought the two were simply two words for the same thing. And I'll take it even step further. This one may surprise you. I didn't realize there was a difference between Arab, Muslim, and Chaldean. I thought they were three words for people who came from the Middle East. And probably until I was in high school or college, I couldn't even have told you the difference. So we would hear growing up that there is a Chaldean community here, that there is a large population of Arabs, there's a large population of Muslims, 
And to my mind growing up, it was all the same thing. It was basically three ways to describe something, describe the same thing. Now, we, so we were aware of this conflict in the Middle East, and especially in Israel, we were aware of the conflict. And we, we were given a kind of sense that, and remember, this is before, this is when peace in the Middle East was seen as a real pipe dream any kind of peace. So we, we saw the, this sort of inherent antagonism there, but here's the, the odd contrast. Growing up in Detroit, we were very much aware that there was this large Arab slash Muslim community in Dearborn, and we knew it was there, but we somehow we disconnected, we dissociated that community from what we learned about the Middle East. So we were walking around in an almost double think sort of way with the, with the notion in mind that in Israel or in the Middle East, there is this inherent antagonism between Jews and Muslims. But in Detroit, there simply is not. Dearborn wasn't a place we were afraid to go. And remember in those days, that, that was the point where we were afraid to go downtown if you're a suburban kid. Dearborn was a place, you know, it was a place you would go. There was there, there was Fairlane, one of the first big shopping malls. Uh, there was the, the what, a state of the art movie theater there. It was a great place to get Middle Eastern food. When you after you'd sampled it in Israel and you'd come back, it was probably the next best thing. And I even remember at the age of fifteen or sixteen, there was a big youth a Jewish youth convention, and it, the convention took place at the Hyatt. Regency Hotel in Dearborn, it simply wasn't an issue. So what I'm saying is, is that there was this odd disconnect between there was a, there was a, there was limited awareness, but there was this uh, unwillingness or inability to link the problems in the Middle East with, with, with what's, what's happening here. And I think of that because, you know, even now, uh, there are many people who assume a, an inherent antagonism between Jews and Muslims, but here in Detroit, we're sort of a living contrary example to that uh, to that problematic assumption. Here in Detroit, we've had a large Jewish community which has ex which exceeded at one point a hundred thousand, living in living side by side and relatively close proximity with a large Muslim community that was even larger, without incident. You know, I I uh, I don't think if we if we look through the pages of the Jewish News and the Jewish Chronicle for the last century. I, I don't think we could find more than a handful exa of examples of tensions there. Now, when you tell that to people who aren't from Detroit, it seems anomalous. In the same way, for example, when I tell colleagues, and I think this is a microcosm example, when I tell colleagues that there was a large Muslim student population at Wayne, but very little in the way of anti-Israel agitation at Wayne, it, it I have to really convince them that I'm not making it up. But... I, I think those two are related. There is something, there's something in the air here. Maybe it's a Midwestern thing. Maybe it's a Michigander thing, uh, which, uh, which creates this particular situation. Now, as I got older, uh, there were points when, when we in the Jewish community did become more aware of the Muslim community. And this is really what I think, and uh, you know, Bryant, I'm sure you could speak to this as well. Later on, this is when we became the, the, the aware of the, the importance of the possibility of having some kind of dialogue and, and, and interaction. Uh, you know, we, we, we really, I mean, the, the real big change was 9-11. But even before that, you know, the, the event that really hit home was in the Iranian revolution, when that's the point when suddenly things Muslim really became it really was front and center in the news apart from the conflict in is with it between israel and its neighbors we became aware of it and i would also say that that was the point when the, in the in the learning about the the the, uh, the islamic revolution in iran that was the point where we became aware that arab and muslim were not the same thing that's that's the moment when we learned that muslims in iran are not arabs in fact, Iranians would consider it an insult to be called Arabs and not Persians. But see, that's also the same time when we became aware more broadly that not all Arabs are Muslims and not all Muslims are Arabs. That, that, that there are many Muslims, most Muslims in the world perhaps are not, 
But see, I was 15 or 16 years old and just learning that fact. So I think there has been a learning curve in the Jewish community in terms of being more than tangentially aware of our Muslim neighbors and realizing that the community is there. But the interesting thing is, once that awareness was there and then interfaith turned from just Jewish and Christian to Jewish, Christian, and Muslim or Jewish Muslim dialogue, for me, and I think for many others like me, that became the point where we became aware. And I, I, I remember thinking this and realizing this, or un understanding this, that Jews and Muslims have more in common in terms of their history, their religion, their practice than either has in common with Christians. Because, yeah, uh, you know, you, when you grow up hearing this notion of a Judeo-Christian tradition or a Judeo-Christian culture or ethic that America is built on a Judeo-Christian foundation, and then suddenly you, where you, you, you've been trained to think that, yes, that's the, the closest thing to being Jewish is Christian, and then you learn that there's something much closer. Uh, it's, it's a little eye-opening and also very, very illuminating. Now, as I said, 9-11, of course, was another moment here. And, and I'll just share one, one moment I remember not long after, actually two moments, two things that happened not long after 9-11, which really brought home uh, a sense that uh, an additional thing that Jews and Muslims have in common in Detroit and elsewhere is that parallel to the phenomenon of anti-Semitism is the phenomenon of Islamophobia. I, I mean, true that I had really never heard the term or really thought about Islamophobia very much because we really didn't think about that very much. But here are the two things that happened. Um, and they both happened at the same intersection, 14 Mile and Middle Belt Road. At 14 Mile and Middle Belt Road, that's, that's, where, that's where our dry cleaners was. And this dry, cleaner was, this dry cleaners was owned by a Muslim family that was Sunni, a Sunni Muslim family. Uh, and after 9-11, they started to struggle for two reasons. First of all, uh, uh, they were a fixture in the neighborhood. This was, a, this was a dry cleaners that everybody went to. It was a great place. But after 9-11, they lost a lot of their non-Muslim customers simply because of 9-11. Because after 9-11, if you're Muslim, then obviously you're Al-Qaeda. Or obviously you're somehow complicit in that. But... When I spoke to the owner and she was struggling and you'd go and the, the window would be cracked or the window would be smashed. Um, she also explained that in, in their business uh, within the Muslim community, uh, because they were Sunni, Shiite Muslims wouldn't go there either. And so they lost that, that segment of the Muslim community, which is Shia and not Sunni, wouldn't go there either. They struggled and they were gone within six or eight months, which was really a pity which was really a shame. But I learned that hearing about that sort of tension and rivalry between Sunni and Shiites, it was another one of those, brought home another one of those parallels. Well, oh, we have infighting in the Jewish community too. And so do they. And how about that? Isn't that interesting? Now, the other thing that happened is, well, at the same, you know, kitty corner from this, um, kitty corner from this uh, dry cleaners uh, was, was what had been Eagle School, Eagle Elementary School. When Eagle closed down, there was a plan to replace it with a Muslim cultural center. Now remember, this is just a few years after 9-11. I don't think this, the, the incident I'm about to, describe, about to describe probably would not have happened before 9-11. But as soon as there was an announcement that that built, a school was going to be a Muslim cultural center, there was an uproar. There was an, uh, you know, uh, uh, I would say 80% fear and 20% outrage that there was going to be some sort of, I don't know what, a foothold for radical jihadist Islam right in the neighborhood. Now, to, to be clear, uh, this, was, this was a less than a mile down the road from Hill Day School where my children were going at the time. And there was just this backlash to this building becoming a center of Muslim culture. Now, to many of us, it's the, the backlash seemed outlandish, but you remember the mentality in those days, people were afraid and frightened. But the conversation I had to sort of really get a, get a handle and a sense of it was, you know, I was friends with the guy who was and is the security, the head of security at Hill Day School. A really nice, a really nice Israeli guy. He's perfect for security. So when all this was going on, I said to him, you know, you're the head of security here. 
are you concerned in any way? And he just went, uh, he basically just said, no. I mean, in that, in that great Israeli way of being dismissive of something ridiculous. He said, of course not, definitely not. But it reflected a mood. And so after 9-11, there was a greater awareness there was a, a, in the Jewish community of the Muslim community. And for the most part, I think that was a positive thing. It led to more dialogue, it led to more interaction, and it led to more learning about one another. But it also had this dark side where some of that Islamophobia that percolated its way into the Jewish community. Now, I, now I'd like to think uh, that, that, that within the Jewish community, that was more the exception than the norm. But it was certainly there, and there were and are those, those people in the Jewish community who are still hyper-concerned about everything Muslim. I remember having a conversation where somebody Jewish threw at me the stereotype, you know, all Muslims are jihadists, or all Muslims are terrorists, all terrorists are Muslims, you know, you know the, the stereotype. And I, 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 uh, I responded to this person basically saying, you know, when you say to, to say all Muslims are whatever is the same as saying all Jews are whatever. And it doesn't matter what the, what, what the whatever is. If you're willing to pigeonhole and stereotype in that way about someone else, you have to be willing to accept those kinds of all Jews are stereotypes about Jews as well. Conversely, if you don't think it's proper to say all Jews are, then you shouldn't do it about anybody else as well. So I, I think in the aftermath of 9-11, there were, there, there were tensions, there were difficulties, there was, there was a measure of fear. But I think more broadly, it, it, it's, it really stirred the kind of dialogue between the, the communities that has been very fruitful and very, very, and, and, and effective in that way. And a, a generation later, you know, my daughters who grew up a generation later, you know, they, for them, 9-11, they were small children when 9-11 happened. It's a distant memory for them. But also, they've grown up in an era where there simply was more familiarity between the Jewish and Muslim communities. They, for example, are aware of the difference between Arab and Muslim, and certainly are aware that Chal Chaldean is something totally different. And they don't just know that for me. They just know that because that's just something kids know these days. It's it, it it's a it, it's a something they're just simply more aware of, so, and so we've come to the point in in 2021 where, you know, there are tensions, of course, but uh, the greater awareness makes it it makes it easier or helps manage the the tensions and complexity. So I, I would just wind up by saying that the more you get to know somebody, or the more one community gets to go gets to know another. Uh, Yes, it, you know, in some sense, the, fami the familiarity uh, makes it easier to understand one another. And of course, familiarity, as, you, as the closer you get, the more willing you are to disagree, to debate, to argue. On the whole, though, it's been constructive, and I would hope that it would continue to be constructive. Saeed, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, my friend. Uh, first of all, I'd like to echo again uh, my thanks to the Jewish uh, Historical Museum our society, I should say, of, of Michigan, to Hillary, to Jeannie for the invite. And really, thank you for getting Howie and me back together for a conversation. I mean, I'm always grateful for those who can. Uh, Bryant, thank you for the all too kind uh, introduction. And I guess I'm a, uh, let's see, a hat, a pair of Ray-Bans, uh, a full tank of gas and half a pack of cigarettes short of the Blues Brothers. But for you, I will rectify that as soon as I can. Um, you know, I grew up, I've been, I've been in Michigan now for, interestingly enough, since 1979, since the year of the Iranian Revolution. And my dad, in his wisdom, decided that um, he wanted to introduce me to a very bustling, multicultural uh, metropolis of uh, Lapeer, Michigan. And growing up there uh, as a country doctor uh, and being the son of one uh, was fascinating because uh, the public there thought we were refugees from Dearborn. So this whole idea about being Arab as synonymous with, uh, with being Muslim uh, is very much an experience as Howie was describing, we also had. And it was interesting because we had come from Houston, Texas, where back then in the 70s, there weren't too many South Asians. Now in Houston, it's an entirely different story. And people thought, well, it's my process of elimination. They couldn't understand Arab. 
they couldn't understand South Asian, they figured we must be some kind of strange Central American that they hadn't really figured out yet. And before that, we lived in New York City, uh, having moved there from London, England, and I grew up in Far Rockaway. And here's the point, I, I grew up uh, culturally Jewish, and the reason being two things. One is there weren't that many South Asians in New York City in the mid 70s. And so they figured I was Puerto Rican with a kind of a fake British accent, uh, but a name that didn't necessarily match up to uh, what they would have expected coming from uh, uh, Spanish Harlem. But we lived in many ways as Jews because of dietary uh, regulations. We uh, knew that back then, even Oreos had lard. Uh, we did an awful lot of uh, label reading. And so we became very familiar, and I did at the age of eight, with uh, being able to decipher a K or a U with a circle or the word pareve uh, when we would go down to the grocery store. And yeah. because there was such a paucity of institutions or infrastructure, we just simply would source our meat uh, kosher. That was the safest way for us to go ahead and uh, get uh, not only quality meat, uh, but guarantee that it never oinked in its entire life. <laughs> and so having that kind of cultural history, that kind of cultural literacy, when we were um, uh, asked to speak about the history of uh, Muslims and Jews here in Detroit, I wanted to try to see if that was an experience that was also something that happened here in the Metro Detroit area. And I would say in some ways, yes, but like how, how he described it, I would say, and you're gonna have to forgive me, but you know, talking about religious communities or faith communities, I'll have to use this word. I think by and large, Muslims uh, in the early years were pretty agnostic about the Jewish community uh, in Detroit. Interestingly, they probably had very similar immigration trajectories in the sense that, uh, coming to America as uh, a land of opportunity. You are probably familiar to some degree because it has become almost a kind of a meme in the Metro Detroit area that Henry Ford recruited people from the Levant, from the former Ottoman Empire, uh, especially from places like Syria and Lebanon, and they came and they came in droves. Well, that is actually true. Uh, so in that sense, the meme matches uh, the reality. But where the first epicenters of the Muslim community were, uh, interestingly, were not in Dearborn. They were actually in Highland Park. And I think about this today as I drive down to work uh, in, uh, down Woodward Avenue sometimes because 75 is in shambles compared to where I live in Rochester Hills. And uh, I notice, of course, uh, the temple uh, a bit farther down on, uh, on Woodward and realizing that this area, particularly near Boston Edison and, uh, and uh, the new center was of course also an epicenter of Jewish American life in the Metro Detroit area. And isn't it fascinating that just north of that, you had the beginnings of a critical mass of the Detroit Muslim community developing. And this was really all around the Ford plant uh, that was there on uh, Woodward that uh, is certainly not in very good shape today, but at least they still have the historical plaque in front of it talking about this being a place where uh, the Model T uh, was made. And it was here that really through the effort of two brothers who had migrated from Syria, we find then the tangible and the visible elements of a Muslim community starting. Of course, there were Muslim Americans who were there, but if, uh, at the same time, the idea of a convergent spot, some public place where people can meet, congregate and convene is very important. And this of course became a mosque. And so what we find then is uh, Muhammad Karub, who had migrated in 1912 from Damascus to work in the Ford plant, uh, becomes a pretty successful real estate developer. Through uh, family unification, his brother uh, Hussein comes over as well, and uh, Muhammad decides we need to build a mosque. And this is then the very first mosque in the Metro Detroit area, the so-called Highland Park Mosque, which is constructed in 1921. Uh, and it was located actually uh, uh, just north of the Davison Freeway and west of Oakland. 
So if you're familiar with that area, you know that it's only a three block walk from uh, the old Ford plant. So it was very, very well located. And that of course was by design, uh, knowing that so many of uh, the Muslims uh, that happened to be there were working at that, uh, at that plant. Hossein Karoub and Khalil Bazi uh, become the first imams there. And one of the things that I noticed about this was that they were non-denominational, meaning that here you had Sunni and Shi'i Muslims uh, praying in the same space. The idea of sectarian division uh, was really not there. And it also got me to think that usually what happens is when the smaller communities or subgroups form their own critical mass, they always feel as though they don't need the other, the other sect involved. When there's a few around, then they feel, well, in order to go ahead and have that sense of camaraderie and fraternity, we'll go ahead and let certain distinctions uh, uh, go to the back burner. But this was a time when you had then sectarian difference really wasn't such a, a big issue at all. And the community itself was actually not too small. Uh, 16,000 Muslims in the 1920s uh, in this area. And the mosque was actually very nicely designed. Um, uh, Theodore uh, Degenhardt, who uh, was the architect, designed other buildings uh, around uh, the area. Uh, unfortunately, by 1926, though, uh, the mosque had to be closed. It was sold to the city uh, because there were several complaints uh, of traffic and also noise. And of course, this is a major deja vu because you hear some of these same complaints made even today about houses of worship. Uh, if you've ever gone past a mosque on a Friday, uh, you know that triple parking is not uncommon to go ahead and see. And they also had funding issues, which then uh, not only caused the mosque to close down, but in many ways caused the epicenter of Muslim life in, met in the Metro Detroit area to shift to the other area where a lot of uh, Arabs uh, were coming in, uh, both Christian and Muslim to the region to work in the uh, factories. And so Dearborn then becomes another uh, major center for uh, American Muslim life. Uh, I like the point that Howie made about the fact that uh, there is this very convenient way to make uh, an equal sign between Arab and Muslim. Uh, but not all Arabs are Muslim, not all Muslims are Arab. And uh, Howie, I think you were looking for the numbers, so let me give it to you. Uh, the Arab Muslim population relative to the global Muslim population is, well, you take a guess. What percentage do you think it is? You're on mute. <laughs> 20%. You got it. Nailed it. See, I, I can always go to Howie. And this is where we should, uh, in, in the spirit of the playoffs, we should go uh, the battery of pitching and catching. You know, because like Steve Carlton and uh, Tim McGar uh, McCarver. I was going to say sixty percent. I was going to say sixty percent to help you make the point more dramatically. Oh but come I, on! We've known each other long enough. We don't need drama. <laughs> it's all comedy. I couldn't, um, I couldn't resist. I had. To, I just had to go for it. Right, nailed it on the bullseye. So yeah, only twenty percent. I mean, I'm from South Asia, and if you take a look at the combined Muslim population of India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh. Uh, that accounts for one third of the global Muslim population. So clearly even more than the, uh, the Arab population. By 1937, there was now a new mosque that is built uh, south of uh, Dix Road. So right behind uh, Rouge plant number one. And this is opened by the American Muslim Society. Uh, it is still an active mosque. And what's funny is, uh, that the mosque was built in the 1930s, uh, and of course with very good intentions, uh, again by uh, Muslims from Lebanon, mostly Sunni Muslims from the Bekaa Valley, uh, but they got the direction of prayer wrong. Uh, if you go to the, uh, the mosque even today, you'll see where the old direction is, uh, and it's pointing southeast. What they didn't take into account was the fact that the world, of course, is a sphere. And from Detroit, the straight line to Mecca actually is in a northeast direction. So of course, they had to then accommodate for going from a two-dimensional to a three-dimensional uh, um, globe. 
It was not the only mosque that was uh, built uh, at that time. Uh, the Islamic Center of America also opens, and this becomes the first uh, Shia mosque in Michigan, uh, founded by uh, Muhammad Chidi. It initially was uh, established on the corner of Joy and Greenfield, but because the population grew, uh, the mosque then that you probably are all very well aware of because it's the largest mosque in North America and certainly one of the most beautiful ones uh, is the Islamic Center of America on Ford Road uh, between the Southfield Freeway uh, and Evergreen. And I think that this is an important point to consider when it comes to the growth of the community and particularly the Shia community from places like Lebanon and also Iraq. Much of that community uh, came well after uh, the original community of the 1920s and the 1930s, really out of a sense of the discord that was happening in the 1970s in uh, the Middle East by way of the Lebanese Civil War. Uh, that then continued, of course, when it came to the first Gulf War in Iraq. A lot of Iraqi Shia came around the same time, I would say, uh, Howie, that the second wave of Chaldeans, Iraqi Christians, uh, also uh, came into the area. But there's another Muslim community that we can also say has a very long history here in uh, the Metro Detroit area, and that is the Nation of Islam. Now, I know that the Nation of Islam, of course, is uh, a very problematic institution, particularly uh, when it comes to its relations uh, with the Jewish American community. Uh, but back in the 1920s and the 1930s, uh, that was not the kind of nation that it was. It was started here in Detroit by a fascinating yet very mysterious individual by the name of Wallace Fard Muhammad. And he started to preach to the African-American community, facilitated in a lot of ways because around that time, you also had the Northern migration, people coming from Southern states, again, with the prospect of uh, employment in, uh, in factories uh, over here. Now he claimed to be an Arab from Mecca to have a, okay, Brian, you know, you set it up already in the introduction. He was on a mission from God uh, for all the Blues Brothers references uh, that we need to go ahead and dispense with all uh, altogether. Uh, what's really important to recognize that according to the FBI, uh, Wallace Fard Muhammad was not Arab and he was certainly not from Mecca. Uh, he had spent some time at San Quentin prison in California and he seemed to be sort of this uh, drifter, grifter type who was... Uh, uh, trying to establish himself uh, wherever he could. Uh, he was successful in establishing uh, what we could probably describe as a black nationalist uh, uh, liberation theology. And he had seven to 8,000 members that would meet about three times a week. And this is where they established what is known as temple number one of the nation of Islam, sometimes also known as mosque number one. And it was located on Linwood uh, uh, in uh, West Detroit, close to Seven Mile Road. That was the start of the nation. And Wallace Fard Muhammad uh, met a guy by the name of Elijah Poole, who really became his disciple. And he then not only accepted nation of Islam, but he changed his name to Elijah Muhammad. And Elijah Muhammad ran the Nation of Islam until his death in 1975, having moved uh, the capital or the, uh, the headquarters of uh, the nation uh, to the south side of, uh, of Chicago. Now, after Elijah Muhammad's death in 1975, uh, the mantle and the ministry of the nation went to his son, Wallace Muhammad or Wadith Dean Muhammad. But within a 10-year span, uh, Wadith Dean Muhammad took 90% of the nation of Islam into mainstream Islam. The remaining 10% then went with uh, the Reverend Louis Farrakhan, and that is the nation of Islam that we know today. Uh, and of course, we know its corresponding ideology, uh, which is quite different than what was the uh, ideology to, uh, to start with. Irrespective of that, the ideology of the nation uh, during its early years and well into even uh, the 1970s was one that immigrant Muslims really had no frame of reference. They didn't understand an Islam that had uh, a racial component to it and a racial political component in the form of nationalism. 
That, along with a lot of other reasons, including cultural reasons, was why the immigrant uh, uh, Muslim community and the Black American Muslim community didn't really have much interaction. It would be wrong to say that it was really a racial issue uh, because again, the cultural divide uh, was simply too much. But at the same time, there were these interesting interconnections between the Black American community and some immigrants. For example, uh, a gentleman uh, came to uh, the Metro Detroit area uh, from British India, from East Bengal. And like a lot of uh, immigrants, uh, of his uh, time and of his ilk, uh, the idea of how to stay in the United States was a very compelling one. Marriage to a US citizen, getting a green card was seen as perhaps uh, the least cumbersome way to obtain one, particularly for those individuals who did not come with uh, very uh, large resumes of uh, skills and education. We have to understand that before uh, the mid 1960s, immigration to the United States from Asia and from Africa was very, very difficult because of some very severe quotas uh, that had been in place. Well, this individual came from Silhet in East Bengal and he married an African-American woman and they had a son. And that son's name was Malik Hashim, but you might know him better as Hanson Clark, who was uh, the Congressman from the 13th district here in Michigan. So Henson Clark having then uh, not only that uh, uh, mixed uh, uh, background of ben being Bengali and being black, but uh, being born a Muslim, his father died at the age of eight and his mother uh, reared him. And uh, essentially he assumed a more African-American uh, identity, uh, especially as he went through college graduating from Cornell and then going into his, uh, his political uh, career as well. But this number of stories of uh, people, particularly from uh, 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 British India, coming to the United States and marrying into the African-American community uh, is not an uncommon one in the Muslim American narrative. Now, everything changes in 1965 with the uh, passage of the Immigration and Nationality Act, uh, a year after, of course, the passage of the Civil Rights Act in 1964. This changes the landscape dramatically because not only do you have uh, Muslims coming from different areas, but without the kinds of quotas that had once been there. The other thing is, of course, the, uh, the socioeconomic status uh, that are now coming in. That early wave was coming in mostly working class. Some were coming in and developing an entrepreneurial spirit like our friend uh, Muhammad Karub becoming a real estate developer. But again, most of them were in the working class uh, echelons. Those that were now coming in uh, were encouraged to be highly skilled and having advanced degrees. And this is where you have doctors and engineers and others, particularly from South Asia, some from the Middle East, and of course, also from Africa and Southeast Asia. Uh, there were students who would come to the United States uh, during the 1930s, 1940s, uh, and beyond up until the Immigration Nationality Act uh, was passed, but these were few and far between, and invariably they would go back to their respective home countries, uh, both because of family reasons and also out of a spirit to take the education from here and go and benefit those, uh, those societies. But starting in the 1960s, you have then this greater synergy, especially here in the Metro Detroit area. And so again, we find people from India, from Pakistan, uh, Bangladesh uh, gets its independence in 1971, uh, people from Sub-Saharan Africa, as well as North Africa in smaller pockets, uh, drawn of course by the big three, drawn by uh, the health industry here as well. But then you also find some fascinating other groups coming in, especially from the Balkans. Uh, in 1953 in Taylor, there was the first Albanian Bektashi Teki or monastery that had been uh, constructed. Baba uh, Rajab was there. And if you were to ask your average Arab uh, American Muslim or South Asian American Muslim coming to the Metro Detroit area, 
they probably wouldn't even have had an idea that there was such a thing as an Albanian Muslim. Uh, when the Bosnian refugee uh, issue happened in the 1990s, similarly, there were a lot of Muslims around that were scratching their heads saying, wow, I didn't know that there was such a, a Muslim population there. In 1963, in Harper Woods, there was the Albanian Islamic Center. And I remember that was the very first mosque that I ever visited when uh, I had moved to Michigan. So to go to Eid uh, uh, prayer, uh, we had to drive about an hour and 45 minutes from Lapeer uh, to uh, this mosque that was right off I-94 in, in uh, Harper Woods, which tells you then that like uh, Howard described with the, uh, uh, the Northwestern migration of the Jewish American community from Metro Detroit, there was time before the suburbanization of a Muslim population occurred. Now, having said that, a good amount of the Muslim population stayed in the uh, city of Detroit or in its surroundings like Dearborn, and then also moved straight into places like Hamtramck. Uh, Hamtramck today is the only uh, city in America that has an all Muslim city council. Uh, and the population is quite diverse with Muslims from Yemen, from Bangladesh, and from several of the Balkan uh, states as well along with still also a Black American uh, Muslim population. Uh, clearly, you have then socioeconomic uh, uh, diversity in the same way that you have that in not only the Jewish population, but the broader Metro Detroit population. So you have the northern suburbs, the western suburbs, uh, which either you have Muslims having moved in or through the process of upward mobility moving into those areas as well. Currently, there are about 140 mosques in the Metro Detroit area, about 10 full-time Islamic schools. Uh, as I mentioned before, Hamtramck got a majority Muslim city council in 2013, and earlier this year, an all-Muslim city council, and uh, Dearborn elected its first Muslim mayor uh, who was sworn in earlier this year, and that is uh, Abdullah Hamoud. Uh, clearly, Dearborn has come a long way from the time when Orville Hubbard, uh, who was a segregationist, uh, ruled for several years from 1942 to 1978. I mean, I think he, he was there longer than even Daly was in, uh, in Chicago. 40% uh, of the population of Dearborn and Hamtramck uh, is Muslim. Uh, but as Howie said as well, uh, large Arab Christian populations are there, perhaps not so much anymore in uh, Dearborn, but certainly elsewhere in the Metro Detroit area. Uh, the current Muslim population in the Metro Detroit area is about 300,000, and it is arguably one of the most diverse Muslim populations anywhere in the world. Uh, of course, you have Muslims from every conceivable part of the Middle East, uh, but you also have South Asia, you have uh, uh, Bosnia-Herzegovina, Albania, Kosovo, some Southeast Asians, some from Iran, some from Turkey, but not very large populations. But right now, one of the fastest growing populations of Muslims in the region uh, are from West Africa, uh, Senegal and the Gambia. And one of the easiest ways to see who's moving in is to see what are the new restaurants coming in. And so you'll find, for example, down near the Redford Corridor, there's a place called Maddie's, which is Senegalese food. Similarly, there's a Senegalese mom and pop restaurant in Garden City. Uh, and it is providing, I think, two things. Uh, one is exposure to the Muslim American community in the Metro Detroit area about how diverse the global Muslim community is. And I think it's also providing that service for uh, Metro Detroit as well to dispel and refute that assumption as how he had put before, that a lot of people think that uh, Muslims are Arab and Arabs are Muslim. Uh, today, the level of interaction between the Jewish and the Muslim communities is how he said, is far, far more than it ever was uh, back in the early days. Uh, that wasn't from a sense of antagonism or acrimony, uh, it was just from a sense of not really having a frame of reference with which to interact before. Uh, today, of course, uh, both out of circumstances like 9-11 and other realities facing Jews and Muslims uh, in the sense of Islamophobia and anti-Semitism both being threats, 
often from the same origin, uh, as well as uh, from the very affirmative and transformative uh, relationships that come from camaraderie and friendship, uh, we find that the Muslim and the Jewish communities uh, are far more connected uh, than perhaps even some of their own members realize. So. Thank you very much. Um, this is Jeannie again. I'm, I knew this was gonna be wonderful, but it was even more wonderful than <laughs> I had imagined you were great. Howie, I, I appreciate so much your perspective of um, the Jewish perspective of Muslims and Saeed, how you brought in the um, immigration issues and um, the history of the mosques. I wondered just if, by the way, everybody who's on, please put questions in the chat before I get to this question, I'll, I will be um, taking your questions from the chat. But I'd like to know this, you had to split your time and this is a huge subject, the history of Muslims and Jews in Detroit. If you were just perhaps going to be asked to do another one of these, um, what didn't you talk about tonight that you might have, that you might want to talk about? What areas did you not have a chance to discuss it, both of you take it in whichever one wants to take it first. Howie? Well, I mean, I, I, I would I would have said more the, about one of the about this notion that one of the learning experiences, I think from certainly I think it's totally gone both ways is the more the two communities have known each other, the better we know each other, the more we realize how similar we are. I, I would say more about those parallels that I alluded to briefly. I mean, like Saeed mentioned, the notion of kosher and halal, I, I you know, keeping kosher is a central part of being Jewish for many of us. And I don't think there's any other religious community in the world that, that, uh, that has something as similar as halal to kosher. And in fact, I remember the first time I saw halal written on a store, on a butcher, I think, and it was either in Oak Park or maybe it was in South or whatever, it was, Dearport, wherever it was, I originally didn't know what it is. And when I looked into it, I said, oh, this is just like, I, I think in my mind, immediately said, this is Muslim kosher. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the the parallels are so striking that the parallel function of the imam and the rabbi is much so similar to each other than either is like a Catholic priest or even a Protestant minister. So I mean I, I think the I think the the similarities between us. I mean I'll give you a maybe a more let's say a more controversial similarity is there is this notion of jihad in Islam which is largely misunderstood. It's usually uh, by many who don't understand it, it's usually telescoped into its most radical, extreme, and violent version. But there's a parallel notion in Judaism called milchemet mitzvah, called this obligated war, which is which is very similar. It's very parallel. So I, I think I think the, those parallels and similarities is something that's always focused, it's always fascinated me. Not only just uh, just in and of themselves, but when you see parallel elements of another community, you learn something. You get perspective on your own. Even the even the very notion that we as Jews aren't the only ones who have dietary restrictions that someone else is doing is keeping kosher too, so to speak. Mm -hmm. I, I I find to be very illuminating. Yeah, I mean, I would I would I mean, I fully agree with uh, with Howie that I mean, we could we could talk in great detail about like those areas of connectivity. And as I said, i part of it might be generational. Uh, for me, uh, being uh, as Howie is as well, I mean, of re relatively the same age, uh, we, I think, come in with those kinds of sh uh, shared experiences about how society was at a certain time. And for us, again, it was a matter of, of, of necessity uh, that uh, we just very naturally gravitated toward uh, the, the Jewish community. And, and without a sense of just saying a begrudging despair, saying, oh, man, we're going to have to be like the Jews. It was, it was a very natural, it was a very organic thing. And mm -hmm. who knows, maybe part of it is because being South Asian, uh, we weren't in the eye of the storm of the Middle East and some of those narratives as they were starting to develop uh, later on, especially in the 1980s. Uh, in, uh, in, in the region. Uh, but for us, it just seemed as a very natural thing to do. Now, having said that, we also are people, uh, Howie and I, who are colleagues at, uh, uh, at a university. Uh, 
Mm -hmm. uh, I would argue that there is a greater likelihood of understanding between communities when people actually work together. Uh, the idea then of uh, this not being like that sheepdog and, uh, and the wolf in the cartoon where uh, they only talk to each other after hours and uh, while the, and when the whistle blows Sam and Ralph, they, uh, they, they're, they're at each other's throats quite literally. Uh, I find that within the Muslim community, those people who may have, I mean, after all, Howie talked about that there, there is 10 percent of uh, people in the Muslim and the Jewish community that seemingly don't want to have anything to do with the other community. And I would contend that those are people who live in, uh, in, in their own silos. Uh, there are enough uh, studies that are done that to know somebody of a different community has a very dramatic correlation on uh, viewing that, uh, not only that person, but that community uh, positively. And at the very least, having then the receptivity to learn from them and also to disagree. I mean, I don't think that this is just simply a love-in uh, that people need to have. I think it's about having those difficult conversations, which I mean, I like to think that Howie and I, you and I have several of them. Uh, we just have them out in public uh, so that hopefully people can learn uh, the ethics of uh, disagreement uh, and realizing that there's more to uh, a healthy conversation of saying uh, yes and than just saying yes but. You actually part, partially answered, uh, mostly answered one of the questions in the chat because I think that the question was that you're both scholars and educators and more open perhaps to wanting to be uh, understanding of other people, interested in understanding other people. And so how are you addressed it a little bit, but just to take it one step further, what really can we do to, if anything, reach those people who just are not of the same thinking? That's a great question. I think uh, the first way to answer the question is to broaden it because, um, if, if they're let's say let's, if they're members of one community who are loath to really engage the members of the other, it's part of a larger problem of mm -hmm. uh, and we live in an exaggerated time of fear and outrage, uh, and we have you know we have the false urgency of the twenty four hour news cycle coupled with social media that thrives on making people as frightened and outraged as possible. The algorithms are designed that way. So the broader solution to the problem is to do something about that. And this isn't just fear and outrage between the Jewish and Muslim communities. This is fear and outrage about everything. So uh, th that, is a, that is a part of this problem as much as it's a part of other problems as well. But beyond that, uh, I, I think, like Saeed said, this is just a question of increasing familiarity, um, and uh, you know, and, and really, in some ways, it cuts both ways. I, um, you know, I, I, I mean, uh, one a generation, my own children have had much more experience and exposure than I did. Uh, I, I'll, I'll just give you an example. Um, the, my daughters went to public school. They played junior varsity basketball, and on their team was a young woman wearing a hijab. So. They they have grown up not only knowing what a hijab is and that and who wears a hijab, but for them it's something very second nature. Uh, it's just something that she that she wears. It's not you know it's it's neither exotic nor controversial, but that's the kind of thing that, that sort of when when something becomes familiar, it's easier to make it second nature. It's easy simply to understand it, not to be afraid of it, not to be disturbed by it. Now of course. There's one other a particular element to the tensions between these communities, and that is that I think comes from one dimensional understandings of the conflict in the Middle East, the conflict between Israel and the Palestinians. Mm -hmm. Anyone who's going to understand that conflict one dimensionally in terms of one side is entirely right and one side is entirely wrong or only see it from one mm -hmm. side or the other uh, is going to be more vulnerable, more susceptible to see uh, that everyone who supports the other side is, is by definition your adversary, a threat to you, a threat to your way of life. And uh, I, I think that that's something that's a mentality that infects both communities. And so part of this is simply 
uh, you know, a, a, a part of the antidote to the problem you describe, part of reaching people like this is to try to pry their minds open even a little bit, to let in a little bit of, uh, let's say, enlightenment to see that uh, the situation they assume to be, uh, they have a one-dimensional understanding is more complex because complexity is a great antidote to mm. fear and outrage. The minute you insert some nuance into something and people have to think about it and realize that there is gray and the gray isn't threatening, the gray actually is what, you know, it's, it's, uh, it makes things more interesting and more accessible and, 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 and that's a way to counteract. Now I'll also just say that oftentimes people like that are difficult to reach. If you have someone who is locked into a perspective yes. and is assuming that anyone trying to change their mind is somehow part of the problem, especially people who buy into conspiracy theories, it's difficult, but you hammer away, you hammer away, and sometimes you get a little, sometimes you can make some headway. Um, yeah, I, if, if you'll allow me, Howie, I, I'll, I'll use the word illumination. Enlightenment's a little too Protestant. Uh, so, <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, but but uh, the, I think to add to that, uh, there's this, this idea that for so many in the communities, uh, both uh, Muslim and Jewish, the issue of Israel-Palestine becomes the only issue. Mm -hmm. And it becomes then a litmus test uh, about whether or not to even engage with members of the other community. And given the fact that there's never a dull day in, uh, in the Middle East, uh, it could really become paralyzing. Uh, one of the things that we found, and I know the work that Bryant does as well uh, is, 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 uh, is, is in on this, that we've never let a situation uh, of what's happening over there, first of all, be something that we are oblivious to, uh, but it is also not something that impedes us from keeping on going on. Uh, in fact, if anything, I think we, um, we get a little bit more entrenched, uh, almost milita militantly friendly uh, when it comes to these, I, I remember when was it, uh, uh, Brian? I think COVID has like skewed my sense of chronology. Was it last year that uh, we had that meeting over Memorial Day weekend um, when uh, when a few of us got together to have a conversation because we were able to tell that the communities were hurting, uh, the events that were happening uh, in the Middle East were very raw, and they were certainly being uh, felt uh, over here. And there was that danger that for some, they were gonna say, that's it, we're mm -hmm. done, uh, we're, we're, we're breaking up. Uh, or for those who were more opportunistic, they could say, aha, see, this is why we tell you not to go and play with them. Uh, and we were able to go ahead and uh, come together and form then the narrative that we wanted to make sure our respective communities heard from us to say, uh, this too will pass, uh, and the importance of having uh, that as being uh, something as as far as we could seep it in. Now, as Howie said, there are going to be people that we're not going to reach, and I think that it would be uh, asking a lot to uh, exhaust our energy trying to persuade them. Uh, they have to do some of the heavy lifting themselves uh, to come to the point where they're, as Howie said, receptive enough uh, to let a little bit of that light in. I, I think I think we have, you know, in terms of this project of, of just getting people to see it, we do have history on our side. Uh, I, I think the, the view of an endemic tension or antagonism between the Jewish and Muslim communities is very, I would call it very presentist a point of view. I don't know if I'm using that term correctly, but, you know, yes, there have been tensions, let's say, for the last century or so, but for a thousand years or 1500 years before that, the relations between Jews and Muslims were better than the relationship between Jews and Christians. You know, along those lines, if I, if I could bring someone from the past to the present to address this relationship, to show someone Detroit, I would love to bring Maimonides here. Now Maimonides, because Maimonides, he had an interesting, he had an interesting relationship 
with with the Muslim world because he he was born in Muslim Spain at a point when Muslim Spain was becoming more fundamentalist and re less receptive to Jews and his family was forced to leave when he was 13 but he didn't abandon the idea of living in the Muslim world he went first to Morocco and then lived out the balance of his life in Egypt which was Muslim and it was a pretty great life and 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 uh, Maimonides would be one to say that yeah so in all groups, there are people who are less tolerant and people who are more tolerant. But in his estimation, on the whole, the Muslim world is a world which is which has a natural harmony and synergy with the Jewish world. Never perfect, of course, but he, he's our, he could be our star witness if we could bring if we had a time machine and if he wasn't completely freaked out by the 21st century. But, <laughs> you know, if it, he, his his life is it, it, it bears witness and it so happens that you know that it, it, there's no there's a significant number of the people who tend to be not receptive about the possibility of camaraderie between the communities who also have a more religious bent and and and, and for them Maimonides is, is this towering authority not only on the practice of Judaism but on life so he really would be a great person to sort of you know his life would is is, is a great testament to the possibilities of interactions. I mean, much of his own scholarly work derived from his interaction with Muslim colleagues. You know, I don't wanna, I, you know, I don't, it's, I, it's sort of reminiscent or anticipating this relationship. I mean, we, we weren't the first ones to do this, Saeed. Turns out this has been happening for a really <laughs> long time. Wait a minute, you're, you're not the Rambam and I'm not Averroes? I mean, <laughs> close, can, close. I, hey, I'm, ha I'm, I'm, happy to, I'm happy to be the Rambam. You know, you know I, I'll take it. I would love to end on You are this definitely wonderful. a Veros. I yes. would love to end on this wonderful note, but I, I just like to bring it home to Wayne State. There have been excellent questions, but there was one question about Wayne State and the relationship between the Muslims and Jews in terms of the students and the life there and anti-Semitism and Islamophobia. And also um, at Wayne, um, is there difficulty with the Muslims toward the Jews uh, and ha what is happening on campus? If we can conclude with that. Well, I, I would say this, I, I would concede that in the last year or two, there has been an uptick, uptick of, I wouldn't call it anti-Semitism, maybe anti-Israel agitation, but it's an uptick from basically none. When I, I've been at Wayne for 10 years, so he's been there a little bit longer. When I got there, I didn't really know the campus very well. I mean, I actually have new stories about Wayne and my parents went to Wayne, but I didn't know what was going on there recently. And I was expecting, you know, you walk into a campus that has lots of Muslim students and naturally it's just gonna be a hotbed of whatever. And it just wasn't there. And what I realized, and it's to your point, Jeannie, is that uh, what you have going on at Wayne is two things. First of all, you, you have many students for whom uh, pragmatic concerns supersedes uh, any kind of ideologically driven activities. They don't have time to, to get mired in these sort of conflicts because they need the degree and it's, it's the, this degree is transformative for them. But I think even more importantly is the fact that uh, for a variety of reasons, Wayne is still a campus where civil constructive discourse and debate still takes place. It is, a, it is an intense intellectual community, but somehow, we've managed to hold on to that ability to have these kinds of debates without it devolving into, you know, the usual things, tribalism and narrow-mindedness and, and, sh and shouting matches. It simply, it simply doesn't happen there, or if it does, it happens relatively little. Now, I, I don't know what the future is going to hold. I don't know where it's going to go. It could get worse. It could, it could go back down to zero, but at the moment, Wayne is a civil discourse campus. Now, I, I, I used to think we were the only one, but I have a colleague who teaches at Duquesne University in Pittsburgh, and she said exactly the same thing. Mm. It's a very similar situation. We're not the only ones. In fact, sometimes I'm of the mind thinking that the campuses that are hotbeds of that kind of tension might be more the exception than the rule, but they're high profile campuses, the California schools, NYU, uh, George Washington University, Columbia, they're high profile, so they get a lot of attention, and there's a tendency to 
extrapolate the entire university experience in North America down to this handful of campuses. So it's certainly there, but I'm, I'm wondering, Wayne might be more typical than exceptional. Same. Well, we're ex I would say we're exceptional around here, my friend. Um, what, were, you at, were you at Michigan when they had the shanties for um, South Africa? Oh, yeah. On, on yeah. the Diag? Yeah, yes. yeah. So, so I think that there is this correlation, as Howie said, that uh, you'll usually find that among elite universities, there tends to be more of this activism. And I mean, Howie and I both have kids at, at, at Michigan, and I think that there is a conceit that people at some of these universities, I think they think they know better than uh than kids at other universities but uh, i think that at places like wayne one of the things that's always drawn me to uh the student body is that they're very practical uh they're very pragmatic as far as why they're there what's their place in the in the larger scheme of things and they're not as swayed by these um the the latest thing i mean i've been there as howie said a little bit longer. Uh, I got there the same year as this geeky sophomore at Harvard decided he wanted to start a uh, an app to go meet women. Uh, I think his name was Mark Zuckerberg. And <laughs> Facebook was launched in 2004. Think about how far the world has come in that much time and what's been the impact and influence of social media and the way that uh, kids interact and also becoming siloed. And despite that, we find that with very, very few exceptions, there's not, there isn't the kind of vitriol that you see happening at other campuses. And I would actually say how, it, I mean, I know, uh, I think we, we, we've earned the right to toot our own horn a little bit. We've got faculty at Wayne State that will not tolerate intolerance. Mm -hmm. uh, we we, we uh, teach courses which never shy away from very, very contentious issues. Uh, but because we set the tone and uh, also the ground rules for discussion on campus, we don't worry about getting canceled or whatever is the latest terminology. And we make sure that no student feels as though they're going to get canceled. And I think that that's really important. Uh, having that kind of chemistry, having that honesty, having that trust and respect among colleagues is hopefully something that not only we demonstrate when Howie and I get together for our conversations, uh, but also is something that is uh, noticed uh, explicitly and implicitly by our students. And I'll just give you the contrast along the same lines. You know, every other year or so, I teach a course on the history of Zionism. And the last time I offered it, you know, you make an e-flyer, you post it on the university site that announces courses, and uh, it got dozens and dozens of dislikes by students who just saw Zionism and just disliked it. And a colleague mentioned to me, you got like 147 dislikes. But my immediate response, which is a, my immediate response was, were there any comments? No comments. So to me, that it's just 147 people clicked, which it means nothing to me. More importantly, and this is why I mention it, that particular time when I taught that course, the majority of students in the course were Muslim students. And I have to say, it was one of the most remarkable courses on teaching about Zionism that I've ever had in my professional career. And I've taught it many, many times. It was probably two thirds Muslim and one third, one third Jewish or so with some Christians sprinkled in. And it wasn't just that they were learning from me, they were learning from each other. I mean, it was happening in the classroom. You know, it's an interesting contrast because I've reached out several times to the pro-Palestinian groups on campus, the extracurricular groups to do programs. They're not interested. But some of the same students who run those organizations were in my class on Zionism. Something about walking in the door of a classroom, of a lecture hall, into the, into the atmosphere of an academic setting sets aside those sorts of ideological concerns. And I think that's one of the things that's driving the, the mood and the atmosphere at Wayne State, the academic part, the, the exchange of information, the exchange of points of view, and the notion that you can maybe, do it. Maybe that's what, uh, according to Bryant, uh, Howie, maybe that might have to be what we talk about in our uh, shared futures lectures this time. Okay, sure. yeah. Let's, yeah. Let's, let's end there. He was hoping that you would respond in some way to that. This right. has been such a pleasure. I think that um, we've not ever had this kind of conversation before. And it, it's not only a first, it's just absolutely remarkable. 
Um, I thank you too for being remarkable educators and amazing human beings. And so with that, we can leave the chat. And I, I hope we can do this again and um, push the history back even maybe to earlier and see where the similarities and differences are. But thank you, thank you very much. And good night, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Great seeing you, everybody. Take, Take care. Take care, Howie. Take care, Brian. Jeannie, Hillary. Bye.